Entertainment This Week is on again, featuring all you need to know in the world of entertainment. We continue a look at the awards season with a focus on literature. Today, I have in the house a 2013 Kane Prize nominee. El Nathan John is in the house and he's going to be sharing so much with us. But first, as usual, we'll take a look at Entertainment Tidbits. Top Nollywood director Paul Appel and actor-director Desmond Elliott both emerged big winners at the Abuja International Film Festival. Paul Appel's latest film, Blue Flames, won the much-coveted Audience Choice Award, while Desmond Elliott's work, Next President, picked up the outstanding film in directing prize. Desmond's Next President also picked up the Golden Jury Prize, while Paradox, also by Desmond Elliott, won the Best Short Film Nigeria Prize. As the Best of Nollywood Awards gets set to hold in Delta State, South South Nigeria, the organizers have released the final list of nominees and the criteria screeners used to arrive at that list. The fifth edition of the Bonn Awards will hold on November 9 in Delta State. The organizers, led by its founder and chief executive, Shen Oloke Tui, say they are looking to set a record for the longest red carpet in the world on that date. Judges from the Guinness Book of World Records are billed to attend for proper documentation of the bid. The most coveted prize of the movie of the year will be a keen contest between the same nominees for movie director of the year. That category features Desmond Elliott, Adebayo Salami, Kenneth Gang, Moses Inyang, and Toba Magbaro. Stay tuned to this channel for more features on the Bonn Awards 2013. The premiere and general cinema screening of Nollywood's romantic comedy Flower Girl held this week in the United Kingdom. The funny movie about love starring Daminola Degbite, Chris Ato, Ekwe Dewa and Chokes Chukujeku and directed by Michelle Bello had its grand red carpet premiere on Thursday, September 26, while the general cinema release will be on Friday, October 4 at Odeon Cinema London. The movie features the hit song Fine Lady from Lynx and we're scared. Coming on the heels of the Milan Fashion Week, the schedule for the South Africa Fashion Week for Autumn Winter 2014 collections has been released. The fashion show holds from October 3 to 5 in Africa's Rainbow Nation, South Africa. Over 30 designers will showcase their Autumn Winter 2014 collections in Johannesburg for buyers, press, and fashion enthusiasts to see. American music star and Mugu Sean Diddy Combs has emerged top earner on the Forbes list of the world's highest paid hip hop artists 2013. Diddy tops the list, pulling in $50 million over the past 12 months from June 2012 to June 2013. Nicki Minaj emerged as the only female artist to make the list by earning $29 million to place number four on the list in the period under review. I am joined by El Nathan John, a writer, a lawyer, a blogger, and if I want to be mischievous, I'll also call you a journalist. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. So let's start by discussing the 2013 Kane Prize that you were nominated for. How was that like? How did it make you feel to be recognized worldwide for your work? Uh, the feeling of just waking up one day on a Monday morning and just getting an email saying you've been shortlisted for the Kane Prize. So there was screaming? Well, not really, because <laughs> I, I, was, I, was, I was alone at the point, so there was, there was a lot of, ah, you know, that kind of thing. But um, it is, there's the feeling of, it's a rewarding feeling, fulfilling mm -hmm. feeling that uh, finally one is being recognized by one's peers. Yeah, and the Kane Prize is a pretty huge deal. Like, it's like one of the only awards I know about literature, as in, and I'm just, I'm not someone that is really into that area, but I, I, I know about the Kane Prize. You understand? So yeah, they, they are. Well, it's, it's one of the most prestigious prizes for African literature, short fiction. Yeah. In, that's wonderful. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Now moving on to another type of award, the Nigeria Prize for Literature. The final, um, the shortlisted nominees, the final three, which was uh, Tade, uh, Amunandi, and uh, Promise Ogochuku. That's for 
Tade was for the Sahara Testament, Amon Nandi for the Through the Window of a Sandcastle, and Promise Ogotchuku for Wild Letters. What did you think? Have you read any of their works? And who was like your personal favorite? Um, one of the slight issues that works nominated for the NLNG um, Nigeria Prize for Literature is that a lot of the books really haven't been read by a lot of people. Mm. And so I am only familiar with the work of Tade Padiola, okay. uh, who I think is, is one of the older poets who have been writing for a while and whose work has, is known by most people who read Nigerian poetry. Yeah. Uh, so he's, he's been on the shortlist is, is not a surprise. Mm -hmm. um, I'm unfamiliar with the work of the other two. Okay. Uh, the, their books are not available anywhere to my knowledge for sale or review, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, Tade Ikpajola's work is, on, of, of the three, the only one, one that you've had for access now to, yeah. that most people have had access to. Okay. Um, again, maybe it's the nature of poetry. A lot of people self-publish poetry, and for competitions like that, some people may put together a collection that has really not been seen by many people okay. to enter for the competition. Okay. That itself is a challenge, but uh, mm. I think that in the coming years, perhaps the Nigeria Prize for Literature will look more toward making sure publications are available you know, to the public, especially when they are on the short list. Okay, now tell me what you thought about Tade's work. Well, like I said, Tade is, is uh, as far as Nigerian poets, are concerned. He's, mm. he's one of the renowned names, okay. people who have been consistent over the years. Um, one of the early people you meet if you want to read Nigerian poetry, you know. Um, his, his work is, is not one that I can, uh, with any, with any, <laughs> with any uh, sense of responsibility attach any critique to. <laughs> I can only say that his work is brilliant. That's what I can say. <laughs> That's very humble of you. Okay, now let's move on to some other interesting gist. Um, there are some leading ladies in Nigeria that came out, emerged as nominees for the 2013 Exquisite Lady of the Year Awards. Their names are Stephanie Linus, Adora Ole, you know, the presenter for for um, Project Fame, Miss Jaye, Choma Chukuka, Chukuka Akpotha, Maria Okanride, Tony Lawani, and many other leading ladies. They mm -hmm. emerged as nominees. So what is your take on these ladies and who is like your, if you are giving the awards, who would you like give the award to? Um, the, 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 that award is a bit tricky for me. It's, I, would, I would not want to put my foot in my mouth. Um, it's it's probably not the kind of thing that I'm very much interested in. You are in. not into women? Because I think that's what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> as far as you, lo you love women, well, you like women, I'm, I'm, you should I'm, be able to say your personal favorite. And I'm sure you recognize some of the names. Oh, no, of course I do. So it's it's, it's just that I'm not, I'm not... Or it's a secret crush. You don't want to let anybody know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not particularly... I've not invested a lot of time in following that. Um, okay. I mean, I've read the news and all of that, but it's not something that I have any strong opinions about. Okay, so now let's move to something that I know you'll be interested in, the Promising Female Blogger of the Year Award. At least as a blogger yourself, you definitely have some interest in this. Well, one, one of the titles I try to repudiate is title blogger. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't like the title blogger, you don't like the title journalist? I like writer. It's very... It says a lot of, you know, it, it covers the it covers field. Covers a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for the um, most promising female blogger, ladunliadi.blogspot.com, oh. Olurisu Peraga blogspot.com. Do you know this blog? Do you know this? Do you know these pages at all? I have seen a few of them. I've, um, but the a lot of them are lifestyle blogs and. Um, current events blogs, entertainment okay. blogs. Like um, next to you, blog spots, yeah. that 1960 chick. That 1960 <laughs> chick, I, I think that's the last, of, in the list, uh, that's the last blog I, I looked at. Mm. Again, more because of the constraint of time than 
any snobbishness on my part. <laughs> um, lifestyle blogs are not my um, place of choice, really. Mm -hmm. So usually, there's, there's just so much thing. There's just so much to read and and so much to write. And that did sound snobbish, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll take a short break now to listen to El Nath and read some of his work that earned him the King Prize, and then we'll be right back to find out some more about him. Don't go anywhere. This is titled, To the Editor of the New Yorker. If I were president, Let's start there on account of how everyone calls me Presido here. If I were president, I would only have affairs with married women or other very powerful women. Not that I find the whole affair business agreeable. Quite the contrary. No one knows the pain more than me. It's just that I finished reading this old issue of Time magazine about Clinton and that young girl that nearly got him kicked out of office. Clinton is a foolish man, I tell you, to be getting involved with someone who has nothing to lose. Everyone knows that the safest affairs for married men are those conducted with married women. You want to know how much of a mess we are in? Just do a DNA test for all children, and there'll be big trouble everywhere. By the way, that silly Latif who bought me the old torn and oil-stained magazine thinks I don't realize that the magazine is from many years ago. They might say I'm crazy, but I know my dates. Latif is one of the four attendants in our dorm. I insist on calling it a dorm instead of a ward because it feels like a boarding school. Sit here, sit there, swallow this, sleep at this time, sleep at that time. Anyway, Latif, some days he treats me well. Some days he talks to me like a proper human being. Other days he just talks to me like I'm stupid and brings newspapers and magazines from the last millennium. But I trust him because he keeps a moustache. Men who shave their moustaches are not good people. They have something to hide. Look at them, Clinton, Babangida, Abacha, Bush, Mugabe, and that pastor whose children called me daddy for 10 years. All of them shady guys. You are an editor, so I figure you are smart. Do the research and you will see I am right not to, not to trust them. Dear editor, do you keep a moustache? Don't get me wrong. It's not a hopeless situation if you don't. Look at our last military head of state, Abdul Salam, a soldier in the same gang of corrupt, coup plotting, moustacheless soldiers. But when he handed over, he did the respectable thing. He grew a moustache and a beard. Have you ever heard him in the news say the sort of things that our clean shaven ex heads of state say? No, it's the moustache, I tell you. On the other hand, editor, our former president, Obasanjo, used to keep a moustache. He used to be sensible, but then he shaved and shaved all his sense away. As you may have guessed, dear editor, I keep a moustache. I didn't always have one. But since I came here, and trust me, I've had plenty of time to think about all these things, I have figured it out. I blame my problems on it, but now I'm wiser. Yes, back to Latif. I think I trust him. I may not be able to count on him for up-to-date magazines, but I can get good answers from him. It was him who explained this whole Presido business to me. He said when I was first brought here, I kept shouting, I am the president, I am the president. Me, I don't remember anything about it. But then that period was not a good period for me. I could have said anything. I even killed the pastor. That's most of what I remember. My head bursting with voices when I laid eyes on him. My body drenched in sweat. A feverish cold all over me. The voice. Kill the pastor. Kill the man without a moustache. That was all I could hear before I strangled the man. Our dorm has two rows of iron beds, the legs of which are screwed firmly into the concrete floor. Some of the guys, like Bobo, who drools and has occasional fits, are strapped to the bed with leather straps. With Bobo, the attendants usually have to be careful because he bites, and I'm sure his saliva can transmit whatever syphilitic madness he has. I learned that phrase from Small Kunli. Syphilitic is quite a tongue twister, easier to write than say. Small Kunle thinks Bobo won't last too long, seeing as his family has abandoned him. Bobo went mad one day and beat his mother in the neck because she was talking too much. Crazy people have superhuman power in their fits of madness, believe me. I see it here all the time. Me, my family hasn't quite abandoned me. They have only stopped coming. 
I still get my supplies every week like clockwork. I don't really care that my mom and sister don't come anymore. They must hate to see me among all these mad people. And madness, it is contagious. I know how hard I struggle not to be like these guys. Again, I think they got upset because the last time they came, I screamed at them for not bringing me my medicated soap and Teju had to come and drag me away and all. I really didn't mean to scream. It's just that they should know that I can't bath with rubbish toilet soap. But Maruf, the morose guy to my left, his family still comes around twice a month. He never says a word to them. He just stares like he has never seen them before. And they smile, all of them, like they practice the smile from home. They bring him chocolates and fruits and sometimes they bring him a family photo. The last time they came, they all stood around the bed and took a photo with him. Maybe they will print it and bring it the next time they come. Maruf only ever eats the bananas. The rest, I think, the attendants take home. But dear editor, I'm not sure about this, so be careful if you have to publish it. Inside our dorm are rooms that are always locked like jail cells. Latif tells me that those ones are the really violent ones. Often you can hear screaming from there. One of the guys, I've never seen him because they never let him out, has killed six people. He's in chains with his hands spread out like a fowl being roasted over an open fire. I really feel okay, editor. I've been here all of five years and I miss my bathroom and bed and kitchen. Do you know I used to cook? Okay, it might not be a big deal seeing as you people do everything upside down in your country. But believe me, here it is a big deal for a man to be cooking a goosey soup. My story is that I went crazy when I found out that Blessed and John Paul, both fair in complexion like the pastor, are actually the pastor's children. Pastor Gilead's children. You see, I didn't suspect on account of how my father, my sister, and my wife's mother are all light-skinned. I really should stop calling her my wife. That evil woman's name is Samantha. I didn't notice that they had both the same crooked feet that Pastor Gilead had. When I saw those crooked feet and thought about it, I knew I could never father children with such crooked feet because we have good feet in my family. So how did I find, find out? The factory I worked for produces agrochemicals. Some guy from the health department raised an alarm about a certain new chemical we were using that came from China. To cut the long story short, we all went for a series of tests, floor managers first. That was when they told me I was infertile. The doctor suspected that I was born with this very bad sperm. That was when I started losing it. The more I inquired, the more I found out, and the more I went crazy. The factory sacked me because they said I was becoming unstable. I had punched my line manager in the face when he called me sloppy. And that woman, that Samantha, when she saw that I was breaking down from it all, she got afraid and moved to her mother's house. She told her mother everything and her mother told my mother. My mother then explained it to me and then I really started losing it. Pastor Gilead even had the nerve to show up at my house one morning. That was when it happened. The voices, the fever, the sweat, the strangling. The next thing I remember was that I was in a straight, straight jacket being taken to this home by order of the court. Small Kunle told me that they found me not guilty by reason of insanity. Not really that I'm insane, but you know this place is better than prison. In prison, I hear that they rape men. So you see, 10 years of all that rubbish and the only way I found out was this company test. That's why I don't understand Bill Clinton. A young, ambitious intern, that's looking for trouble. He could have found other powerful or other married women, women who know how to keep secrets. Only a man without a mustache can be that foolish. Dear editor, if I was president, I would keep a mustache. I know you will say that my wife was a married woman, but dear editor, there are exceptions. I hope to get out soon and then I'll send you an email. I hope that you will publish this story somewhere in your magazine. You can title it, If I Was President, or How a Pastor Stole My Family, or even, and I like this one, How Keeping a Mustache Saved the Rest of My Life. It really doesn't matter. Thank you, dear editor, and hoping that you will seriously consider having a mustache if you don't already have one.
apart from you being a lawyer and a writer, tell us something more about you. Well, I, I'm a full-time writer. Um, I've been doing a bit of journalism these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I do essentially is uh, I write non-fiction okay. um, for a couple of publications. You have described yourself as a good writer of satire, so... No, I'm not. Um, I write satire, that's all I've said. You write satire? I've not described myself as a good writer <laughs> of satire. Okay, so could you explain to us why satire is like one of the areas you choose to write in? Well, I, I discover that um, it's, it's very easy to scream and shout about certain things and to express emotion and to be very direct and angry about the things that are going on. Yeah. It is not, you know, people are tired also of hearing these angry voices and, and all of that. So sometimes one has to devise a new means of telling the same stories mm -hmm. um, in a way that reaches people. Because people shut out when they hear angry voices. Nigerians are, are used to being angry and loud and, you, you know. So, Sometimes you need a more subtle approach to, to discuss issues and make people think deeply about them. The same things that they uh, encounter every day, but told in a slightly different manner that makes them care about it. Yeah, makes it easier for you to swallow. Some yes, food. and of course the, the, the use of sarcasm, irony, humor, um, makes the reading even more enjoyable. And so what it does is that it keeps people glued or, or, or keeps people on the issue for, for as long as you are, you are willing to take them. Yeah. So I, th I find it very effective to use, to use satire instead of you know, regular... Okay, I get that. Very true. Um, you also once said that you would like to be, get arrested for blogging and <laughs> therefore get famous. And it's like a strange wish. So why are you just being funny or is that something that you actually want to happen? Well, I've been to a Nigerian police station and, <laughs> and a Nigerian prison. I, I would not wish that upon my enemy. <laughs> uh, no, it was, it, was, it was actually me being funny. But then um, my, what I simply meant was that, yeah, you know, I, I hope to, you know, prick the right people in the side and, and push people to action. To have a reaction. Yes. You know, it's like, it's better to have even if it's a negative reaction and to have no, no reaction, reaction at no, all. Yes. <laughs> okay, now, moving on to something more dicey. El Nathan is one of my boys. That's what the famous Ngozi Adichie said, and you responded with the consequences of loving Ngozi. So now, what's the status <laughs> of the relationship right now? Have you guys kissed and made up? Or is the battle line still drawn? There's no relationship. <laughs> <laughs> there never has been. Anyway, uh, more seriously, um, I think it's an old issue. It's, um, it was one of those unfortunate things that happened uh, in close communities, like among writers. Yeah. I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, passions are inflamed. Sometimes people say things. Sometimes other people misread things and, and writers people, are yeah, passionate people yeah writers are very passionate people everyone speaks with passion no one wants to be uh taken for granted uh but then i'm 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 sure that if we were to meet again it will not uh, maybe you know it will not be such an issue i i, I don't okay. think you know yeah tempers have died down you have passed that well I, I don't i don't even think there were any tempers on on her part I, i'm sure that um I don't even think she thinks about it, <laughs> even though I can't speak for her. But uh, yeah, I would hope that, you know, I would greet her, Madame, well done, mm. when I see her next time. You'll be you know, polite and everything. That's good. I'll be genuinely polite. <laughs> so tell us what you're working on right now. I have finished work on a collection of satirical essays. Um, and a collection of short stories. Okay. Um, the due date for publication is uncertain at the moment, uh, but I expect that by the beginning of 2015, I should have both of those books out, uh, including, um, uh, I will know, the, uh, by that time also, I will know the dates for, 
for the novel I'm writing okay. currently. So I'm also writing a novel, which I, I'm, I'm almost done with. Okay. And I expect that that too should, I mean, if anybody thinks it's worth anything, mm -hmm. should probably uh, be published in the next one or two years. Hopefully, fingers crossed, so that we can... Hopefully, I mean, <laughs> that's if, if somebody thinks it's worth anything. Believe me, from what I've heard of your work, I'm sure that you get a publisher. Well, we hope Amen. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, as usual, I'll end with where do you see your career in the next 10 years? Well, um, in 10 years, I would expect that, well, I would have written a few more books. Um, I, of course, would have also tried my hands on a few new things here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, I expect to teach more, which is one of the things I like to do. I'm also a teacher. I, I teach creative writing. Okay. Um, uh, so I, I expect that I would have, I would teach more. Uh, I, I want to move more toward uh, academia as time goes on and, and do, do more of, of teaching. Okay. okay. I also would like to see um, more movements and be part of more movements uh, that try to uh, encourage literature in Nigeria, especially movements that try to encourage publishing in Nigeria. Um, I, I expect to be part of some of these movements that would see more and more Nigerians having affordable books yeah. um, in their hands. Yeah. Uh, something that you know, can reasonably compete with the fast trend of information online. Mm -hmm. uh, and us as writers adapting to the media as it changes and adapting to even the way people read and the way people interact with information. Yeah, and I'm hoping that the truth is that no matter how far technology moves, there's still something about opening a book, hearing the rustle of papers and all that, that, you know, it's just very nice. But I agree with more uh, Nigerian writers, their books being um, readily available. It seems not really to be so available to us, except for the, you know, the ones that have been published you know, in your literature, for literature classes and all that. Yeah. So I hope that actually works because I'm looking forward to that. I'm a big, big, huge, huge writer. Sorry, reader. <laughs> well, you can make the transition. <laughs> okay, thank you. So very nice having you on the show. I had loads of fun, especially listening to your story, which, of course, should be the dangers of having a mustache. That's my personal <laughs> title. So... I look forward to seeing more of your work as the months and the years go by. Thank you very much. It's yeah. my pleasure being here. <laughs> You're welcome. So join me again next week to get all you need to know about your favorite celebrities on NTA Entertainment. <laughs> <laughs>